From Southern California, this is The Circle of Insight, a show about everything in psychology. Hear the latest in news and views on psychology. Our motto is simple. Wherever there is psychology involved, we are there. And now, here's your host of The Circle of Insight, Carlos Vasquez. From wherever you are around the world, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the psychology of pitching. With us today is former Major League pitcher Sean Estes. He had a 12-year career in the pros. He also pitched the 1997 All-Star team. Let's welcome Mr. Estes to the circle. Welcome, sir. Welcome. I'm happy to be here. Now you're where, where are you right now? Scottsdale? I'm in Scottsdale I'm at Scottsdale Stadium right now as we speak. I live here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, spring training's going on. About ready to uh, watch the Rockies play the Giants. Uh, we have a we do during the week we do webcast games, so all the games are broadcast over the internet. So my partner Doug Greenwald and I do. Um, he does all the games. I do a handful of them um, whenever I can get over here and gets me prepared for my real job, which is uh, I do the pre and post game for for Comcast Bay Area up in San Francisco. I do about 40 games oh, wow. uh, as an analyst up there. So this keeps me in the mix uh, so I can kind of keep tabs on what's going on with the players here for the Giants. So uh, I'm familiar with what's going on when the season starts. This is like your spring training. This is my spring training. Exactly right. <laughs> All right. So I want to explore the mind of a pitcher. Like, I don't know. Yeah, this can be kind of... I'm trying to see how I can do this, but do you remember the very first day, your debut, I think it was uh, September of 95 with the Giants. Do, do you remember that first day? Oh, yeah. How was yeah, that for I, you I, on the mound? Uh, well, I was scared to death, to be honest with you. I was <laughs> pretty nervous. I had, I had started the season in, in low A ball with the Seattle Mariners and was traded to the Giants, uh, I think, in April or early May. And I went from low A ball with the Mariners to low A ball with the Giants and then made the track from low A ball to high A ball to double A, thinking that was a pretty productive season. I was heading in the right direction, both uh, you know physically and more important, mentally. We had ended up winning the Texas League Championship in double A. I was in bed getting ready to take a flight back to my hometown of Gardner, Nevada, uh, spend the winter with my family, and uh, got a call from Bobby Evans, who at the time was the minor league uh, coordinator said, no, no, you're going to St. Louis tomorrow. You just got called up to the major leagues. So I got on a flight to St. Louis the next morning. I ended up pitching, I think, three days later in Pittsburgh. Um, oh, wow. And uh, in, in Three River Stadium, which no longer exists. But uh, I just remember being extremely nervous. Uh, the, the, world, the year had been pretty whirlwind for me. And, and, but my confidence level at that point was pretty high considering – I pitch extremely well, you know, toward the end of my summer in the minor leagues. And then we just got done winning the uh, Texas League Championship, and I threw pretty well in the playoffs that year. So this was a whole other experience for me and, and uh, something that I was in a challenge I was ready to take on. But nothing ever really prepares you for taking the mound that first time in a major league stadium against a major league team with teammates you don't know, you know, considering that I didn't start the year with an organization. So there's all. It was all unfamiliar territory for me, but the one thing that was familiar, and that's getting on the mound and, and pitching. But uh, I just I remember re running out to the mound in Three Rivers, uh, you know, from the dugout, and not being able to feel my legs, which wasn't a good feeling. <laughs> and my I was racing, and the adrenaline was pumping, and I was just saying to myself, just please throw strikes. That's all I cared about at that point was just throw strikes, and I didn't really concern myself with pitching at that moment. Because I mentally, I really couldn't get to that place of, of clear focus. But after that first hitter was out of the way, I was able to go and I was able to pitch. And uh, I didn't have a great game, but I had a really good first inning. So I remember the first batter I, I struck out, second batter I got out, and I think third batter I struck out. And um, so it was a pretty, pretty, pretty uh, memorable first inning of, of, a, of, a, um, of a debut. Who was that Someone guy who struck out? Well, the first batter was a guy named Jacob Brumfield that I struck out, and then I ended up striking out Orlando Merced, or might have been—I think I struck out the Orlando uh, Jacob Brumfield, and Jay Bell was the second hitter. I struck him out as well, and then Orlando Merced flew out. So I think that was the order that it went: one, two, three. Look at that—he remembers it from almost 18 years ago, <laughs> and that's all I remember from that game. <laughs> that was it, huh? <laughs> yeah. I can't remember who the big dog was back in '95 for the Pirates. 
Was that Bonds? They didn't really have a big dog. No big dog like that. <laughs> third in their lineup, but not to discredit Orlando Merced, but you know, he probably wasn't a three-hole hitter you know, for the majority of his uh, career. He just happened to be at that point in their lineup. That was after you know Bobby Bonilla was gone and Barry Bonds were gone and Andy Van Slyke were gone, just right after that era. So, um, okay, that's right. It took easy on me a little bit with the lineup. <laughs> what was the first big name that you faced and you said, "Oh yeah, boy"? <laughs> well, it wasn't in that game. It was probably the next game I pitched. Um, I think it was either against the Rockies or the Padres, but you know the Rockies at that time had the Lake Street Bombers, so. Uh, I That's remember right. Larry Walker being a guy that was um, Tony Gwynn. I faced with the Padres was a big name at the time. Ken Caminiti. Uh, I only made three starts in September of 1995, and then um, started the year in AAA '96, and then was up for good All Star break in '96. And so that All that 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 start after the All Star break in '96 probably was more memorable than any start that I made in my career, being that it was in L.A. against the Dodgers and Dodgers Stadium, our Giants rival at the time, against a really good L.A. team with Mike Piazza and Eric Carros and Raul Mondesi. Oh, wow. So those are some of the guys that I really, that I remember. Did you, um, let's start delving into the mind of Mr. Estes here. Uh, what was going through, does your mind change, for instance, I hate to say this to the people out there who are ninth in the batting order, but does your mind change when you're facing a third hitter or fourth hitter when you know, uh, okay, I got Mondesi to deal with, I got Caros to deal with, compared to whoever was batting ninth at that time? Does it change a little bit? Well, yeah, fortunately, I played in the National League my whole career, and I never had to face the okay. DH other than an interleague play. So, But, yeah, the ninth hole hitter was usually an out, which is the pitcher, and if you got a hit off you, it wasn't a good thing. So um, more importantly, like the bottom part of the lineup, yeah, and, and the, the, the focus has to be from start to finish, regardless of who's batting, the focus has to be about execute, executing pitches, period. And you can't be phased with who's coming up. You can't be phased with, you know, how well they've been hitting coming into that game, the name that it's on the back of their jersey. It, you have to have a game plan before you go out there and, and pitch, and you have to be on the same page as your catcher for the most part to, to execute that game plan. So I was just focused at that point in time on executing pitches and, and being on the same page with my catcher. And I felt like that my stuff was better than that hitter on that given day. And if it wasn't, I was going to have to find a way to get that hitter out. Um, if you start to start to think about who's up to bat, more, more or less, you, you, you don't really focus on what's more what's important, and that's getting the guy out. You end up all those other other distraction about the name of the guy and what he can do to you, and the damage that he can do, rather than executing that quality pitch at that time. And if you execute quality pitches against, doesn't matter who's up, you're going to get them out majority of the time. So that that was what I was able to focus on, you know, more so when I got to the major leagues. Um, and I didn't do that as well in the minor leagues until that 95 season when I made my major league debut. I ended up turning the page mentally. That's fascinating. And how much do you count on the catcher? Well, I, I did quite a bit, and I wanted a catcher that was, you know, that, that worked just as hard as I did as far as looking at video, going over a scouting report of the opposing team for that given day because I wanted to know when I took the mound that we were together um, in that game and that I could trust what. He, signs he was putting down. Now, ultimately, I'm the one that makes those pitches, and I can't second guess myself. But it really does a lot for a pitcher's confidence when you are on the same page as your catcher when he's throwing down pitches that are signs, and you're already thinking about that pitch before he puts them down. Then you're definitely convicted in what kind of pitch you're going to throw on that given at bat. It's when you have a catcher that he throws a sign down. You had something else in mind. You're like, why is he throwing that sign down? Maybe he sees something that I don't. You make the pitch that he calls, you give up a hit on it, and now you're like, well, why did I throw that pitch? That wasn't the pitch I wanted to throw. <laughs> so you like to have a catcher put the sign down. You're thinking along with him, and it just makes the flow of the game go that much better, and then your rhythm as a pitcher is that much better, and your confidence as the game goes on continues to improve You know, based on the results you're going to get. Um, so the catcher has a lot to do with going out there, and, and, um, and I felt – you know, staying in a nice rhythm in that game where the confidence level can stay high. Speaking about confidence level, I pitched a little bit when I was younger at the Orange County Fair. Um, but <laughs> I remember one thing. When you when you strike and you hit those those bottles, 
you get pretty amped up and you think you can do it three times in a row. Do you get that way too when you strike somebody out and it was really good, maybe three pitches, the guy's gone. Do you get more amped up and is it sharper, or is it easier to focus? What does that do to you? Well, yeah, well, it depends you know, on, on what kind of pitch it was. You know, it, you can fool yourself only a few times in a game, and that's by if you're not executing a pitch but you get positive results out of it. I think over the time, you know, you're not going to have the success. I think you're fooling yourself. But if you're executing pitches that you want to throw and you're getting positive results, then that definitely boosts your confidence to another level. So if I'm striking a guy out on three pitches, but it's three pitches that I wanted, three pitches that I executed the way I wanted to, then that gave me even more confidence going to the next at bat. Now, yes, not to say that I'm going to lose confidence by striking a guy out on a pitch that I didn't execute by just maybe getting a little lucky on that pitch. I still got the positive result as in the out as the out, but I I realized that. I still had to maintain my focus and then I got away with one in essence. So that's the that's the mind trick that I would play is that you know what that you didn't make the pitch you wanted to, you got a positive result, but over the course of this game if you continue to make those mistakes and not execute pitches, you're going to get burned for it. So I still had to maintain that acute focus from batter to batter regardless of the result that happened previous. Wow, how much of a how much of this game is is mental when it comes to pitching? Sounds like a lot of it. Well, I see a lot of guys at this level in the major leagues that, that, that have the skills um, physically, um, throw 95, 96 miles an hour with a above average breaking ball and maybe even above average change up. Um, and, but the, the, the problem is, is that they can't execute pitches consistently or with runners on base, they can't slow the game down. And so out of the stretch, they're a little too quick because their adrenaline's pumping and they're trying too hard to make a pitch. Um, so that to me is all mental and not a lot of guys get to the major leagues and have it all, have it, have it all right mentally. I mean, that's why a major league pitcher, you know, if you have a long career, you have to make adjustments, you know, as you go. And a lot of those are mental adjustments and learning through trial and error. So, um, you know, the skills are there for a lot of these guys. They wouldn't get to the big leagues, but then they have to kind of learn on the job as far as, you know, mentally, you know, how they're going to, how they're going to progress rest and some guys just never figured out mentally and can't handle the pressure of pitching in the major leagues can handle the pitch the pressure of pitching in a packed house with the visiting fans getting on you or um and so that's that's another mental hurdle so i i think that the guys that are able to simplify the game mentally and focus on what they can control and that's executing a quality pitch with conviction um then they're the, they're the guys that, that have a short-lived uh, experience in the major leagues. Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So. We're only a phone call away. Thank you. Let's take a uh, brief look at some of these pressure spots I see. Um, one of them, uh, maybe I'm dating myself too far back. I'm trying to remember who was the speedy guys in the, in the 90s. Um, but if you Ricky had like a, Henderson. Ricky who, Henderson was fast. If you had you him know. on first base, did that kind of disrupt your whole game when you're on the mound? Well, that was his job. That, that was why he's a Hall of Fame player and why he was so successful in the major leagues is his job was when he got on first base, which he got on quite a bit because he hit for a high average, his job was to disrupt the pitcher enough to where his focus wasn't on the batter 100% and it was on him to where the bat, he would make mistakes to the batter because they were thinking about him over at first base because he was such a, a threat to run. Uh, as a pitcher, you know, it's hard, especially when you first get called up to the major leagues, to really focus on the batter at that point because you know what he can do over at first base. So fast runners, 
a lot of times will, you know, will lead to big innings because of that. So you have pitcher focus on most important thing is to get the batter out. Um, and then you have to also maybe mix in something a little quicker to home plate, like a slide step so that you can disrupt the runner's timing as well. Um, Greg Maddox used to, it took three singles to get a hit or to get her for the opposition. So if he did his job, which was to get the hitter out and executed pitches to the hitter, it would take them three singles. Um, but he was <laughs> likely going to get the hitter out if his focus was on him. If his focus was on the runner, those singles lead to triples, doubles, and even home runs, and they put runs on the board right away. And he wasn't the greatest at holding runners on because, like I said, he didn't really care. You know, he knew that if his focus was, took, was, was away from the batter, that there was a lot more damage that was going to be done. I remember it just you remind me of, of watching um, the Cardinals in the days when they had uh, Vince Coleman and and Ozzy Smith and they had all these little as Vince Scully would Willie. call them rabbits. Yeah, Willie, Willie McGee was another one. McGee. Yeah, they played a lot of games 2-0, 2-1, 1-0 one, because they had great pitching and then they'd manufacture runs and um, you know there were there were I didn't like facing those type of teams. You know, I liked the guys that were up there swinging for the fences and when they got on base they, you know, they weren't a threat to run. I, I liked facing those type of guys because I, I knew that they'd clog the base paths. But you know, if I made pitches to them at the plate, that I was going to get them out. Yeah, that uh, yeah it made me nervous just watching the game, watching these guys. Um, now, since we're talking about psychology of pitching, you met with a psychologist that, that dealt with a lot of pitchers, uh, Harvey Dorfman, I think it was his name. Uh, he wrote a yep. book, Mental ABCs of Pitching. Um, what did you learn from him? Well, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I, I learned one thing from him, and that was that you control what you can control. And so there's not a lot that you can't control in the game of baseball or actually when you go out there and take the mound. As far as as soon as you let go of that pitch, a lot of things can happen that you can't control. One, the guy hits the ball to an infielder and he makes an error. That's You did your job. He didn't do his job, but there's a runner on first base or maybe even second base. Or you let go of the baseball and you throw, in your opinion, a strike, but the umpire calls the ball. That's not your control. Um, the results are not your control. But if you consistently throw, execute a pitch, all right, not just execute a pitch, but execute a quality pitch with, with conviction, meaning that it's the pitch you want to throw, your focus is where it needs to be, and you execute the pitch with conviction regardless of the outcome, you did your job. And after that, nothing else is in your control. So it's pitch to pitch. It's not thinking ahead. It's not thinking about what already happened. It's not thinking about your inability to sleep the night before or you didn't get the meal that you normally used to use. You do before you actually go out there and pitch. It's about that task at hand, living in the moment, and executing a quality pitch with conviction. Now, it's very hard to do, but if you could do that for, say, 100 pitches a game, you're going to have success more often than not. That's great advice. Uh, we're going to answer a couple of fun things. I know you only have a few more minutes before we go. Uh, did you have any superstitions like uh, Boggs had chicken every day? Uh, did, did you have anything like that yourself? Well, my superstition was to, to have the routine. I didn't want anything to – I wanted to have a routine from the time I woke up in the morning, depending on if it was a night game or a day game. I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to eat the same thing. I wanted to get up at the same time. Um, I wanted to put my uniform on the same way. Uh, from the time I got to the ballpark, I wanted to you know, have my snack at the right time, go in and get stretched by the trainer at the same time. I just had a routine, and I think routine is huge. I didn't have like superstitions. Like I would, I would do something. I would put something in my back pocket, you know, when I went out and pitched, or I would uh, wear one, you know, once under, underneath my underneath my sock. I would wear a different color sock, whatever, like that. Like there's some crazy stuff that goes on out there. Turk Wendell was probably notorious superstition guy. He brushed his teeth in the middle of innings, and, and he got out. He got out of hand, really. There were so many things. That, that he had that it distracted mainly ultimately it distracted his teammates in, 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 you know between innings to where they just said you got to cut that out so it was just more about the routine on a on a game day basis that 
I wanted to, no surprises. I just wanted to be able to. And then there's certain things that are out of your control, like weather. You know, sometimes you're in a rain delay, and you got to figure out how to adjust when it comes down to that. Or you're in 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 any delay. It starts to rain while you're pitching in a game, and then you have to come off the field. And but that to me, those are the type of things that you learn over the course of a career. You know that you have to go through those experiences to. To real to find out what the right you know method is to go out and make yourself allow yourself to be successful. We got one more or two questions before we ask you our final fastball question. We ask every guest. We don't prep you for it, but it's coming in a little bit. And I know you can handle it because you were the first pitcher in Giants history to hit a grand slam. Well, second now. Well, second Madison Bumgarner hit two last year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So I know. I know. He, he, uh, it was a little disappointing for me because because uh, I, I, I had that distinction of being the only giant pitcher to San Francisco giant pitcher to hit a grand slam. So, yeah, he, he said, I see your grand slam and I raise you another one. <laughs> he had two of them. But so you he, did it in Candlestick, uh, I didn't first, you? I was the first guy to do it, but uh, since I, Madison's, Madison's got me. Did you do it in Candlestick Park, though, right? I did it at AT&T Park, which at the time was Pac Bell Park. The okay. first season of the new stadium in 2000. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, one of the questions I have before we get to your fastball question, um, do you have a mentor? Any pitcher that you looked up to? I know a lot. I've talked to other former major leaguers in the past, and for some reason you always hear Nolan Ryan. <laughs> always pops yeah. up. But did you have anybody? Because you're a lefty, I think. I'm a lefty, but as a high school kid, I, 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 didn't ment- I, I did idolize Nolan Ryan. You know, and I and I just because of his work ethic, I, I think that that was the one thing that I felt like you can control, and that's how hard you work and your effort um, on a day-to-day basis, as far as lifting weights, running, uh, throwing, whatever it might be. Nolan Ryan epitomized the work ethic uh, mantra that, that you hear a lot because he was able to pitch so deep in his career and be so strong and successful and continue to throw hard because he was known as the hardest worker in baseball. And he felt like he had the mental advantage over the next guy because he would, he said, I outworked that guy. I deserve to win here. I deserve to have success. So I, I idolized him as a young kid. And then, you know, along the way, there was a lot of people that were instrumental in my career as far as pitching coaches go and, and players I played with. The Ron Romantic, as far as mechanics go, where it was a guy when I was with Seattle that got me really locked into my mechanics that I really, in my routine before I actually pitched in a game, that I actually had my whole career. So uh, little checkpoints mechanically. And then uh, when I got to the big leagues, Dick Pohl was my pitching coach, and he had a lot to do with just my mentality and um, you know my, my day-to-day routine and my bullpen, you know, my bullpen you know, practice between starts routine and just my ability to focus um, within a game uh, he, he knew what buttons to push with me and how to get the most out of me and then as it is you know as my career goes as far as guys I played with you know there was a few guys Mark Gardner who's now the pitching uh, bullpen coach for the San Francisco Giants he was real good as far as make the mechanics went just talking the mental game um, a lot of guys you know different yeah. Dusty Baker was a guy that was really good as a manager as far as getting the most out of his players, and he knew how to get the most out of me and had the way to talk to me to motivate me. Um, and, you know, some of the same thing, had me read books, you know, mental books and warrior books and just, you know, how to go out there and, and really gain confidence and how to beat the competition, um, you know, every fifth day for me and, and for those guys that played every day. He was a guy that was able to go out there and, and get the most out of his players as far as just by being able to motivate them. So, yeah, a lot of different different people along my career that, that helped, my, um, helped pave the way. That's fantastic. I mean, that's one of the great things about this interview right now, you're giving so much information to the youth, a lot of great advice and a lot of tips, learning mistakes, things you've learned to make you even better. Fastball question, are you ready, sir? I'm ready. Who would be a hitter you would like to face that you've – I mean, this is before your era of pitching. So before 1990, is there any hitter you would have always wanted to face? Would it be Babe Ruth, DiMaggio, anybody out there? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, those guys I wouldn't want to face. I mean, obviously, for <laughs> obvious reasons. They're, they could do some damage, but just to say that I did, yeah. Um, well, who, who would I like to have faced? Uh just to say that I did, you know, I, 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 um, 
I got to actually face some guys that I wanted to face, you know, at the end of their careers is guys that I grew up watching, like in Will Clark, I was able to face him and I was actually oh, wow. able to face Barry Bonds as a visiting player. I mean, after I got traded from the Giants. Um, I got to face Tony Gwynn. I got to face Ricky Henderson, a bunch of Hall of Famers. Oh yeah, you did. Uh, but guys that I didn't, the guys that I didn't play with, that I would like to have faced. That's a good question. I think. I mean, never really thought about it. I, I actually have never <laughs> thought about it. I'd have to think. Um, I would like to have faced Mickey Mantle or Roger Maris when they were going after the home run record that year. You know, because I got to face Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 98 when they were breaking Roger Maris's all-time record. And uh, just the hype surrounding, especially late in the year, the hype surrounding every bat that they did have uh, was pretty awesome. Uh, just international hype. You know, 98 was one of those years that kind of brought the fans back to baseball after the strike in 94. And Sosa and McGuire had a lot to do with that, chasing Maris's record. So I think facing either Mantle or Maris – Back in the day when they were duking it out for the home run title, that would have been pretty special. That's a great Just insight. I never even thought about it that way. And not even and, and being that guy that not want to give up a home run. You don't want to be part of the history books, I don't think, at that point. <laughs> but to be able to face them at the top of their games when they were both just on a, a home run power surge and they're both pushing each other to to break that record, I think would have been pretty special. That's a great point. Never thought about it. Thank you so much, Sean, for being on The Circle. It was great insight. I can't wait to see what the feedback is going to be from all the young people out there. Enjoy your show out there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, even in the diamond, we're going to be there. We'll see you next time, everyone.